Uh, I guess as the interviewer, it's up to me to start, and I'm going to start by saying I had not heard of Peter, nor had I read of any, nor had I read any of his books uh, prior to agreeing to do this interview. So it's a damned lucky thing that I really liked the book uh, before she knew him, because it would be really hell doing an interview with somebody whose book you really hated. <laughs> that is not the case. It's a terrific book. <laughs> anyway, he's the uh, author of Before She Knew Him, which is a psychological thriller. And that's a term that I think uh, most people have heard of. I mean, it's a uh, lot of thrillers come out today under the ubric of psychological thriller, but I'm just going to uh, mention the names of Peter's four free previous thrillers. All the Beautiful Lies, Her Every Fear, The Kind Worth Killing, and the interestingly, at least to me, titled The Girl with a Clock for a Heart. Uh, kept imagining TikTok. That was the only title that was sort of originally mine that was kept by the, um, by the publishers. And it was my first book, and I thought, oh, you get to pick your titles. And then I found out very, very quickly that you, as an author, you don't get to pick your titles. Um, your editor in the marketing department um, you can pick them. I mean, you, you can luck out, but, and then they ask, but, you know, they reject a lot of titles and they end up going for something that they think sounds good for marketing. So that's, as you said, the only interesting title there was the one most I picked. Interesting. To yeah. me, anyway, yeah. it's the most interesting of the titles. Uh, I had the same experience. I have two books that start with the girl on the, or the girl in the. Yeah. And that was my publisher really wanting to capitalize on that. Gonna have a whole conversation about girl books and, and how yeah they push me for more girl titles as well so I, I think they're probably going to be more coming yep. um, before we get further into before she knew him uh, could you tell us a little bit about you you know all that David Copperfield stuff <laughs> my David Copperfield stuff isn't very David Copperfield um, but I grew up in uh, Massachusetts. Um, in a town called Carlisle, which some of you may have heard of. It's right next to Concord, which all of you have probably heard of. Um, and I was just one of those uh, kids who read um, everything I could get my hands on. So, and especially if it had anything with a mystery in it or anything dark or any bad people and all that sort of stuff was just what I loved. And um, so, you know, I loved Roald Dahl as a kid. And then, as you know, I was a precocious reader. So at 10, I, I started to grab my parents' beach books, um, you know, uh, that they were reading, at, you know, like Jaws, which, um, you know, I wasn't allowed to see Jaws in the movie theater. I was too young, but I was able to read the book. Um, and if you read the, if you know anything about that book, it's very different than the movie and that it has a very sordid um, affair between the character Chief Brody's wife and the character played by Richard Dreyfuss in the movie, which is not um, in the movie, The Affair. So I learned a lot from that book at age 10. Um, <laughs> and then I read, I, the other one I, re I really remember is Coma by Robin Cook, um, which was a big thriller at the time. And um, it was set in Boston and it was really creepy, scared me, scared me to death. Um, but you know, the more I got scared, the more I wanted to read adult books. So I was just the kid who read adult thrillers and um, grew up to be an adult who um, tries to write those kind of books as well, so. Do any writing as a kid? Oh yeah, I mean, I, um, I wrote little stories and I wrote, I wrote a lot of poetry. Um, again, I mentioned Roald Dahl. I loved Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and you know, the Oompa Loompa songs from the movie, those in the book, they're poems. Um, and I was obsessed with those poems. I read them again and again. So I did try to, a lot of my own poetry. Um, so I was always writing, um, wrote a lot of poetry, even through my 20s and my 30s. I wrote a lot of short stories, um, sort of dark stuff. And then I think in, in my 30s, I was like, well, I, I want to see if I can write a book. Just see if I can start one and finish it. Um, and that started my book writing career. And as soon as I wrote a book, I was like, this is my favorite thing to write. You'd think it would be, I don't know, harder than a short story, but in a weird way, like once I find, um, I mean, once you're in a book and you're sort of in the midst of it, I love, I love that process of getting up every day and continuing the story. Um, so I think, you know, that's where I'm most comfortable as a writer. I agree with that. I've never written a short story in my life, but. 
looking at your bio, I see you went to Trinity College, which I assume means Hartford, Connecticut, and not yeah. Dublin. Not Dublin, right. Okay. And then you studied at UMass Amherst and Emerson. Uh, did you get an MFA or anything? I did get an MFA at um, Emerson College uh, uh, for poetry. Um, this was sort of in my 20s, and that was my primary interest was poetry. Um, and yeah, so I studied there, and I did workshops. But I did workshops in fiction, um, and I did two really great workshops in screenwriting. Um, in, and I haven't gone on to do a lot of screenwriting, but screenwriting is great for structure um, because when you're writing a movie, it's all about structure and when things happen. And um, I think that was really helpful in, I had a great teacher, Chris Keene, and I think that was really helpful when I started writing books to really think about um, you know, what moves the story along. And he had a lot of great advice like um, your, your movie, your, this, this has to be the most important moment in your character's life like the, he had a lot of great advice about how to how to tell a story that people would want to watch or read um do you, or is one of your books this one perhaps option for a movie yeah i've had um I, I currently have three options out if you don't know what an option is it's it's uh they sort of rent your property for a period of time they it's like a year or a year and a half and um and they also say really exciting things to you, like we're so excited to make this movie and these are the actors we're thinking about, and then you don't hear from them for the next year and a half. Um, and that's, that's my experience so far. Um, it's, it's great though, I mean an option's great because it's a little extra money that they throw at you and you don't do anything for it. Um, Very little extra money. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, if it happens, that's great. Um, what I'm excited about, I, I'm not that excited because I don't know if it'll happen, but the new book, Before She Knew Him, is actually the first one that's been optioned for a TV series. Um, and it's, um, they're seeing it as like an eight-part series that they would sort of pitch to the, um, to the streaming services like Netflix. Um, it's the people who just did You, which did very well on Netflix, which I actually think, um, I think that's a, a great idea, like I think a lot of um, novels work well in that eight episode arc. Now, it's tough, I think, to uh, uh, squeeze a three, four hundred page novel into an hour and a half movie without losing something. Sometimes the movie's better than the book, but usually not. I actually, they, so on Kind Worth Killing, which is my second book, they actually wrote a script and then they, they actually sent me the script, which is they don't always do. And I thought it was pretty good. But it's, I mean, they just had to cut and cut and just streamline it. Um, and I think there's something about turning a novel into a shorter series that can be better. So um, we'll see. I mean, you know, again, I, it's, um, you hear stuff and whenever you hear stuff, it's very optimistic because I think, I think unlike book people, and maybe you have this experience, book people are very practical, like publishing houses, they're like, we're gonna put out this out there and we'll see how it does and, and you know, hopefully we'll sell a few copies and <laughs> Hollywood people are like, um, I was actually, I actually met like Hollywood producers and they, they were like, you are hot right now. Um, <laughs> and, and so when you hear that, you go, uh, yeah, I'm hot. <laughs> Yeah, like, I must be hot, because they're telling me, you know, he's a hot property or whatever. I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know if they meant me or my book, but um, it all sounded good to me. They talk different, I mean, and then nothing happens, so. You must have cooled off. Yeah, I cooled off considerably. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe I'll get hot again. <laughs> uh, which, of the book, which of your books won the New England um, Society Award? Yeah, the kind worth killing. Have you, do you know that award? Did you win that award? I didn't win that award. Uh, in fact, I had never heard of that award until I, <laughs> until I read your bio. It's a very strange award. Um, it's a society that's in New York City, and it was started like 200 years ago by people, basically people who missed New England, who lived in New York City. So they started a society to get together. Um, you know, back when it wasn't as easy to travel back to New England on Amtrak train in four hours. Um, and yeah, so I won the best, uh, the book that represented New England, something like that. They have a luncheon and um, I think you get, you know, you get a small, 
Yeah, fifty dollars, which is sort of like very New England, I think. <laughs> cheap, very cheap. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you to tell us about your book, but literary agents, as you well know, and some of you may know, uh, use a term called the elevator pitch, which is how one is supposed to approach an agent if you don't happen to have one, with the short summary of the book that will excite them enough and hook them enough into the idea. Um, and may, maybe it takes a minute or two, but let's pretend we're on the top of the Empire State Building, so it'll take a little longer to get down the elevator pitch. Could you provide an elevator pitch? Yeah, so an elevator pitch, well, I'll do my, the really short elevator pitch is that um, a woman in a suburban neighborhood um, is convinced that her neighbor's a killer, um, but no one will believe her. And I think that's my true elevator pitch in the sense that you know, you're riding with an agent in between a couple floors and you have to sell it really fast. The, the slightly longer one is um, this woman, uh, Hen, has recently moved with her husband to uh, a suburban Massachusetts place called West Dartford. Um, and she, they meet their neighbors, another married couple, and they go to dinner at their house and she sees an object um, that convinces her that uh, her neighbor is a murderer. But Hen has a history of mental health issues. She, she is bipolar. And during a previous episode when she was in college, she had falsely accused um, a fellow student of a crime they didn't commit. And that's on her record. So she's in a sense a very unreliable witness, um, even though she is currently doing, doing well with her diagnosis. So, um, and it's, it's um, it's not a spoiler to say that she is in fact right. We, get, we learn very soon in the beginning of the second chapter when it flips to the perspective of Matthew, the neighbor, that he is in fact a killer. Um, and so that the, the book becomes more, less a, who, less a is she right about whether her neighbor is a killer and more about their relationship moving forward. And it's called a psychological thriller. Uh, could you tell us what, in your view, at least, is the difference between a psychological thriller and a plain old thriller? Yeah, I, I should have been prepared. I actually just wrote about this. Um, I mean, I think a, a plain old thriller is um, like finding out who the killer is. Um, there's a lot more action. I think a psychological thriller just relies a lot more on why, why are the villains or even the protagonists doing what they're doing. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a heavier emphasis on, um, on the whys and the reason, the reasoning behind the crime. And I also think they tend to be, fall a little more into the gray area between black and white. So if you think of a, a very, um, I think of James Bond as being like a, a, a pure thriller in the sense that James Bond is on the right side and he's, trying to stop some megalomaniac from destroying the world, and it's, there's not a lot of psychological nuance there. Um, doesn't make it a bad thing. Um, so I think, for me, this, most, most of what I'm interested in, I'm really interested in ordinary people who are on the cusp of doing something bad or, or tip over into that area. So I really like that gray area, and I think that's what makes me more psychological. As you said, uh, your, your key character, your heroine, Hen, suffers from bipolar disorder. What made you decide to give her this particular disorder, or any disorder for that matter? Well, I mean, there was, there was, um, there was a, a, re a plot reason. Um, well, I'll give a little background on the book, just because um, it, this, the original idea for this book came from a movie I saw, um, which... Uh, a movie from 1954 called Witness to Murder, starring Barbara Stanwyck and George Sanders. It's a totally forgotten film, but I caught it on probably Turner Classic Movies about five years ago. It actually came out the same year as Rear Window, but it, and it's also about a, um, a witness to a murder across the street. Have you heard of this movie? I have heard of it. I yeah. haven't it's, watched it. It's, well, you haven't watched it because it's not a very good movie. Um, <laughs> I watch a lot of not very good movies. Yeah. Well, you should watch this one, and I do too, and I'll watch anything um, with Barbara Stanwyck and um, anything that's a thriller. Um, and so the reason this, so 
just quick thing. Barbara Samwick's this interior decorator in uh, Los Angeles. She looks out her window one night and she sees George Sanders across the street strangling this blonde woman. And she calls the police and the police um, come and she tells them what she saw and the police go across the street and they knock on George Sanders' door and George San and they say, uh, excuse me, sir, your neighbor just said she's, they saw you killing a woman. He goes, oh, that's ridiculous. I haven't killed a woman. And they go away. Um, he's killed a woman. She's in there. And, it's, and, and one of the reasons the movie doesn't work is if you know Barbara Stanwyck, you, she's utterly believable and she's a straight shooter. Um, and the, you, you know, the police should obviously believe her. And if you know George Sanders as an actor, he's clearly um, a murderer. I mean, he's this charming, oily guy who, who kills people. So... <laughs> Um, it gets so silly that at one point, um, the police, she keeps saying, I think he's really a murderer, and the police actually have her put into an insane asylum because she's accusing him of this crime. So eventually she has to, um, you know, prove it herself or whatever. Um, w after watching this movie and thinking about why it didn't work, I thought, well, one of the things that didn't work is she was a reliable witness, but what if she really, I, I got thinking, like, what if a witness really did have a history of um, having accused someone of something that made them an unreliable witness? So, so there was a plot point, um, or plot reason behind wanting um, this event in the past of my character, Hen, um, I did also want to write a book um, with a character who has bipolar. I'm, I have someone very close in my life who's bipolar, and I wanted to do some slightly different things with that, um, with that character that I feel like I haven't seen in a lot of thrillers. I feel like there's a lot of thrillers right now with unreliable narrators um, in which the protagonists are dealing with um, inter mental health issues or um, agoraphobia or alcoholism. I, I wanted to um, have her have this in her past, but I wanted it important that, I thought it was important that she be doing really well right now, and in fact, she doesn't doubt herself. It's not one of those stories where she's like, I wonder if I'm imagining the whole thing. She's, she, her meds are working, she's doing well, it's other people who don't believe her. Um, and I also just wanted to show someone with bipolar who, um, who was functioning very well and that wasn't, it wasn't used in that special way. And I also didn't want it to be, um, there's one other way I, I think uh, pop culture is now using mental health. I think of um, Homeland with Claire Danes, if anyone's seen that. Um, there's this sort of way in which mental health can be used as a, as a superpower almost. Like, it makes them better at catching the, the villains. I think Will Graham in the um, Red Dragon, the Thomas Harris books. So I wanted her to just be an ordinary person dealing with a mental health issue. Um, and I, I hope I caught that in the book, but that was my intention. I think you did catch it very well, but I will also say, uh, I guess by definition, uh, murderers uh, are uh, psychopaths or have sure. some other mental health issues. Uh, in this book, you identify the killer, as you said fairly early on in the book. Um, can you tell us about the psychology of the killer, or would that be too much of a spoiler? Um, yeah, I think I think I'll I can talk a little bit um, without going into the big spoiler territory. But um, again, maybe it's a trademark of psychological thrillers. But the book spends a lot of time in the head of the killer, Matthew. He um, he comes from a a really damaged background with a sadistic father who basically um, kind of tortured him um, and his brother and um, his mother. And in response to this, he, he envisions himself as someone who um, saves women from bad men. Um, and to do that, he'll, he'll kill men. Um, it's how he met his wife. She, she was someone who... Um, was being abused in, uh, in an apartment building he was in, and he dispatches of the, um, the guy. He's, he's very, he thinks he's very practical. He thinks he's just ridding the world of, um, of uh, you know, abusers. Um, but he also has, it's, it's also a, a serial killer type of thing. He really does have this sort of bloodlust, and he's just channeled it. 
Um, so, and, and then there are more complicated things about him, um, especially involving his brother, so, which I won't go into, but um, I did like, you know, I like to think about, I don't know if it's empathy, but I mean, I, I do like spending time in villains' heads, and I think it's important to try and understand, um, as a writer, it's important to try and understand, like, how do people become the way they become, how do bad people become the way they become, and I, so I thought a lot about him as a, as a child and what he went through with his father and how that made him the way he is today. Okay, of course there's always the classic uh, child uh, as the young psychopath who kills his uh, baby dog or cat or what have you. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I'm not going to go there with that. Uh, as I was reading um, the title, uh, Before She Knew Him, I was wondering if the hymn referred to uh, Hen's husband Lloyd or to Matthew, who turns out to be the killer, or to both of them, in which case you could have called it before she knew them. Um, I think it, it definitely means um, Matthew, the killer, although it could mean, I, I mean, I think you could take it in, in different directions. And um, it, so this title, this is a good example of um, what we were talking about with girl titles. So um, they, are, they wanted the pronoun she. In, in the title of the book, the, my publishing house. So um, they really like this title. I think I like this title okay. Um, I preferred um, my title or a bunch of other titles, but it worked for me because I think um, at one point she thinks how when she's talking about Matthew, before she knew him, she felt like she already knew him, like she was going to meet him one day. Um, and that's sort of a feeling she had. And so that was interesting to me. But I do think um, they are really, because I mean, your library patrons, your readers, you guys have seen this trend of um, the girl books, and they're trying to capitalize in on that. And um, so the other words they're looking at are, are she pronouns, Woman, I mean, they're putting putting all of those, and you've so you've had you have two girl books out. You I have said? two girl books. I finally escaped from girl books uh, with novel number six, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I, to give the uh, publisher a little credit, uh, we consider a whole bunch of titles, and they say what they like best, and I say what I like best, and they listen to me, but they don't necessarily title the book what I like best. I think they listen to me too. I think I think if I, and a couple titles I've said, you know, I really don't like that, and they wouldn't do that. Yeah. I mean, they're they're nice enough not to make you unhappy, but ultimately they are talking to their marketing department, and um, they're thinking about what will sell. So absolutely, and starting with the girl with the dragon tattoo, I guess was the first of the girl books, wasn't it? Or were Which, there some I, before that? So what's really so my first book was a girl book, and I. I named it after, I was thinking in terms of like pulp books from the, um, from the 50s and 60s, particularly like John D. McDonald. He, has a, he had a book called The Girl in the Plain Brown Wrapper. Um, I thought of it as a sort of a pulpy title. Um, and then when it came out, someone said, oh, he's trying to capitalize on, at the time, it was Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And then of course there was Gone Girl and The Girl on the Train and all these other ones have come along, but I had originally used that title thinking about, um, thinking it sounded like something from the 1960s. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to your plot a little bit. Um, one of the characters I found curious, as well as interesting, was Hen's husband, Lloyd. It struck me that Lloyd, you present Lloyd as not a particularly sympathetic character. And I was wondering what your rationale was because wouldn't it take some level of being a sympathetic character to marry somebody who you know suffers from bipolar syndrome? I, th I think Lloyd is, I think he's like a semi-lazy guy. Like he's basically a good guy who's just fighting sort of selfish. Um, I, he, he, he might be like a, a weird criticism of like, Maybe myself, I don't know. <laughs> you're not a very nice guy. And you're <laughs> no, I, he, he's not a bad guy, he's, but he's, there's something about him, he's just, um, 
he, he's decent, but he's going to take the easy way out. Um, and I, I think I learned that about him as I, as I wrote the book. At first, I, I didn't really know that much about him. Um, and I just, you know, by the end of the book, I didn't really particularly like him. But he's not, um, he's not evil. He's just, you not know. Not very likable. He's not very <laughs> likable, yeah. Um, obviously, the main character, Hen, is suffering from uh, bipolar. And bipolar is a very common condition. Uh, did you do a whole bunch of research into bipolar and uh, the meds for it and the out? Come well, some of that is just that. through my, uh, like, a personal family experience and knowing that. But if, I've read quite a bit about bipolar, and I've read um, a, a very good book about that is um, Kay Redfield Jameson's An Unquiet Mind. Um, and she's also written a book uh, that, about the links between creativity and bipolar called uh, Something on Fire or something like that. But um, she's a very good writer um, who suffers from bipolar herself and is also a psychiatrist. Um, so yeah, I mean, I did a little bit of research, but in general, I'm not um, I'm not a sort of research person. I'm just um, reading the Jameson book is a form yeah, yeah. of excellent could, research, start, as a matter yeah. of fact. I mean, I have a schizophrenic in my second book, and I read a bunch of memoirs by schizophrenics. Yeah, I mean, that's the best um, that's the best research is to actually just read a book and kind of absorb it, as opposed to picking out details that you're going to use. I think sometimes you can over research something. You know, you're reading a book and suddenly you're like, oh, someone did research and they're doing all these specific things. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it's better, as uh, you suggest, with the, uh, the Jameson book to read memoirs of people who have suffered from this because yeah. you are creating somebody who suffers from yeah. this. Um, who are your favorite authors and what do you like about their work? Um, Aside from me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> James and, well, Patricia Highsmith is a huge influence on, of me, the um, mid-century writer who wrote famously Strangers on a Train, Talented Mr. Ripley, but I've read all her books and um, I love her. And I, you know, she's, she's someone who often doesn't have likable characters and often um, is in this, the gray area I'm talking about of, uh, of morality. I love her. Um, I love John D. McDonald, who I just mentioned. He's someone I read quite young and got into. He's kind of forgotten now, but um, he wrote the Travis McGee series, but he, his standalone books are really terrific. Um, Ruth Rendell, who just recently died, is an English thriller writer. Um, I love her books. She wrote um, great whodunits with psychological insights as well. Um, I'm trying to think who else, you know. That the big influences, and you know, Stephen King was a huge influence um, as a as a New England writer. And just reading him as a young reader, um, he wrote. You know, we know him as this horror writer, but he also just writes great details about characters and um, captures small towns and and all that sort of thing. I'm sure you guys have heard of him, right? Published five novels. Do you have a personal favorite? Um, this one, actually, the new one. I know that um, in some ways, Kind Worth Killing has been my successful novel. It's gotten the most, that's when I get emails, I get it about Kind Worth Killing. I think that really um, connected with a lot of people. And I think my, the favorite, my favorite character I wrote was Lily Kintner. She's a main character in um, Kind Worth Killing and she's a, she's a sociopath that um, I get a lot of emails from people who tell me how much uh, they like her. Um, which is an odd thing, you know, is it wrong to like this character? I get these emails. So I, I think I'm most proud of having written her because I think she's... What's her name again? Lily Kintner. She's the main character in Kind Worth Killing. So I, I'm most proud of her, but I think in terms of books, I'm really happy with this uh, before she knew him. Uh, before we go to questions, and I'm sure folks will have a lot of questions, I'd like to ask you, uh, can you tell us anything about the book you're working on now? I assume you're working on another one. Yeah. Um, it's kind of done. I mean, it's it's actually off to the editors right now, so I'm in that like nervous waiting to hear from them mode of what they think. Um, it's it plays around a lot with my love of like classic uh, mystery fiction because the the main character is um, a man who works at a mystery bookstore and he runs a blog out of this bookstore. And uh, years earlier, for his first post on the blog, he wrote a list of the eight most perfect murders in mystery fiction. 
Um, and he's forgotten about this list at this point. And a few years later, an FBI agent shows up um, and says, uh, you know, it looks like someone's using your list to kill people um, and emulating these, these mysteries. So I had a lot of fun with it in terms of um, coming up with, you know, these books. Like there's an Agatha Christie in there. There's a Patricia Highsmith. Um, all sorts of books that I love. Okay. Um, time to go to questions or anything else you would like to uh, say before we do that? No, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, just out of curiosity, you mentioned early, uh, early on that in this new book that you're in the head of the killer. Uh, a question actually for both of you. How do you get in the head of the killer without being a little demented yourself? <laughs> That's how you get in the head of the killer. <laughs> you aren't. Um, one, you know, so I'll, I'll, I mean, it's imagination. So you're, you're, you're not that person, obviously. Um, so it's, it's empathy and imagination. Um, but in, in some ways, you're, you're, I'm trying to tap into that, like, small part of myself. Um, you know, when you're, when someone's done, did something wrong to you, you know, years ago, and there was that five minutes when you were like, ah. Oh. I could have killed this person. Um, and then because you're not a killer and you're a, you're a law-abiding moral citizen, those five minutes pass and you get over it. So I just try and tap into that and stretch it so that, um, you know, try and, try and get into that part of myself that would, that would let that fester and eventually want revenge. So I, I'm trying to, like... Um, you know, imagine what it would be like. So in the case of Lily Kittner, um, she is a character who um, is not a serial killer in the sense that she needs to kill people. She's someone who's not bothered by killing people. She sees it as equivalent to stomping on a bug. Um, she thinks there's so many people and so many lives out there that if someone deserves to die, she's, she's willing to do it um, in a practical way. Um, so I just try to imagine what it would be like to live free of those moral boundaries. Um, what would that feel like? Um, and I think that's your job as a, as a novelist, in a way. Um, most of my books, I don't know if you've read any or not, uh, but uh, a lot of the story is told from the point of view of the killers. Uh, killers are at least as important, I think, in most of the books uh, as characters as the, uh, the police series is uh, 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 two Portland detectives who work together and solve these crimes, but we spend in each of the books at least as much time in the head of the killer. Um, in fact, uh, the, I've been faulted for letting the reader know who the killer is fairly early on, which is one of the reasons I asked you that question. Uh, but I think it's very interesting to delve and mine the psychological uh, sicknesses uh, that lead somebody to commit murders and why they commit murders and um, uh, how they view the fact that they're killing murders is something that they should do, if not as a profession, at least as um, a frequent hobby. <laughs> do either of you actually interview killers? No. I thought you were about to ask us if either of us actually killed people <laughs> when you started that question. Um, I haven't, no. Nor have I. Uh, a writer named Chelsea Kane was once asked what she does for a living. She says, uh, I kill people for money. And that's probably a good answer for any mystery writer. Uh, questions? Yes? When you start a book, to what extent do you have everything outlined in advance? To what extent do you make things up as you go along? Yeah, yeah so I'm, uh, I'm someone who makes it up makes it up as I go along. So what I, what I start with is always a premise. Um, so in the case of this, it's these neighbors, one of whom knows this secret about the neighbor and can't tell anyone or can tell people and they won't believe her. And that's my premise. And then I, get, and then I think about the characters and who they are, and then I start writing. Um, now, I, I think there's people who say this, like I just make it up as I go along and the characters take over the story. I mean, I'm, as I'm writing, I'm always thinking ahead. 
So I'm thinking about scenes I want to have or where I want things to go, but I'm not outlining. I'm not saying this chapter has to be this. I'm keeping it pretty free and loose. And sometimes when I write, actually most of the time when I write, I have an idea of an ending that I think would work. Um, and I, so I'm sort of shooting for that. Um, and sometimes that changes by the end of the book. But in other words, I'm just filling, I'm filling it in as I go and letting myself um, sort of free associate and think what the, what the characters do and try and keep it loose that way. Um, it's to me, it's the best way to write for me. Um, it does, it does lend itself to a moment in the middle of writing every book where I'm sort of at page 150 and I'm overcome with this sort of existential dread that I've gone 150 pages and I don't know, like I'm, I don't know how I'm going to finish this. And it's, it's sort of a black pit. And then if you crawl out of it, I think, um, and then suddenly you, you, hopefully you have this realization of like, this is where it's going and that's a great moment. Um, so, so this is the process that I like. How do you, you ever changed your mind about who the killer is on page 150 or thereafter? I haven't, but um, you, usually I do know the back, I know the back stories. Um, I've changed the mind, I've changed my mind about like someone dying um, I did, I did in this new book, I had someone die and then I kept writing and I was like, no, 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 I, I actually, they need to be in the story longer. Um, so I've changed my mind, but I've, I haven't changed my mind about who the killer is. Um, you know, I haven't. Have you? I had, did in my first book. That was the only book in which I did go halfway through the book, absolutely convinced uh, that I knew who the killer was. And, why the son of a bitch had done the nasty things he'd done, and uh, and I said this is too obvious. <laughs> this is not going to. This will bore the pants off anybody. So I sort of did a whole bunch of rewriting and uh, changed my mind about who the bad guy was. So, um, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, do you uh, start at chapter one, or do you sometimes uh, have a scene in mind that's somewhere in the middle of the story and begin with that? You know, or is it always sequential? Yeah, for me, it's always sequential. And um, it's funny because sometimes you will have a scene in mind that you want to get to, um, and I'll just wait. Like, I'll, I'll just write my way up to it and then do it and try, try and keep it in my mind, which doesn't make sense. I mean, I should write it down if I already have it in my mind. But um, my theory on, um, on ideas, the big idea of the book and then the little ideas in the book as it goes along is that if it's a good enough idea, it'll stick in your mind. And if you forget it, then it was meant to be forgotten. So I don't take a lot of notes. I don't write notes as I go along. I just try and keep thinking about the book and, and hopefully the good stuff will bubble up to the top. So I always write sequentially, starting in chapter one, straight to the end. I always write sequentially as well. Uh Having said that, I always write sequentially. I have been known more than once to take a chapter that's somewhere in the middle of the book and move it somewhere else in the book. Sure. So uh, I guess that means it's not literally sequential. But uh, uh, like Peter, I am uh, not, you know, the, the writer's world is divided into the people who do outlines and the people who are called uh, rather cutely pantsers, which is short for seat of the pants. And uh, I think. I know I am, and it certainly sounds like Peter is a seat of the pants kind of guy who has an idea of what the story is about and then just starts writing it. So I, uh, personal belief is I think that's the best way to write a book. So, Do you think it's the best way to write a book? Do you think it's the best yeah, way? Yeah, I do uh, too. James Patterson did a uh, TV master class thing in which he describes how you, the viewer, uh, for a small fee can learn how to become a famous mystery writer. And apparently, I assume he does this, or he has his co-writers do it, writes a very, very detailed outline of the entire story. Um, I could never make that work because it would just drive me crazy. And I tried it in my first book, and I was off the outline on my, on my page three. So anyway. It kind of takes the fun away from the writing. I mean, there is something if you had a full outline of exactly what was going to happen and then you then you're writing it is just kind of becomes this drudgery of like 
you're, you're, you're not going to be, as you're writing, you're not going to have that moment of like, oh, wow, this could happen next. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, to me, is always the best, you know, when something clicks along the way, and you're like, wow, this could happen, and you're like, that's a good, and that's such a great feeling. Yeah, it's, it becomes wooden, I think, and uh, I guess there are a fair number of wooden novels out there. I don't know if they're all written by people who outline or not, but it's, yes. Can you talk about the typical process of working with an editor? Sure. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear from uh, Jim as well, but the um, editors are not, they don't do the editorial work we all think of them doing. I mean, some might, but um, I have a very editorial agent. So my agent and I work really hard on a book. I, he gets my first draft and he comes back with a lot of suggestions. And I work with him, he reads a second draft his wife, who is the co-owner of the agency, reads a draft. So by the time it goes to my editor, um, it's been through a lot of editing, and my editor has notes, but they're, they're pretty few. Like, he doesn't really go through um, the book and work with me. It's not like that, um, is it William Sean? It's not like that William Sean and F. Scott Fitzgerald working together on a book, putting the pages on the floor. I think editors' jobs these days, um, especially in a big house, um, a big publishing house is um, their job is to sell. See if you think I'm correct in this. Their job is to um, to sell their client list to the the sales force, um, pretty much, and get the sales force behind their book, the books on their list. They do a, they do a lot with marketing. Um, my I, I love my editor and he has good suggestions in my book, but it's we don't. It's it's a pretty minor editorial relationship. I have exactly the same experience. Uh, in my case, both with my agent and with uh, my editor, uh, who is we're uh, represented by the same pub or published by the same publisher, uh, Harper Collins. But um, I, she has my editor has made some suggestions which have improved my books, but they're generally fairly minor. Um, it's the kind of suggestions that can be taken care of in a day, two, at most a week. Uh, but I'm, I'm very persnickety about my writing. I'll, I go over it and over it and over it and over it until I think it's as polished as I can possibly make it. And um, that's just the way I am, and I think probably the way you are. Yeah, I mean, write, uh, revision is, there's uh, every, every writer out there is revising a lot because that's, I mean, the, the first draft is, is not done. It needs a lot of a lot of revision, and some of that's through editorial work, and some of that's just on your own. I can I can say that I don't really have a first draft because I go over each chapter six or seven times before I get to the next chapter. So by the time I get to the last chapter, the whole thing's been gone over a zillion times. Anyway, sorry. Yes, ma'am. So I'm curious. At the beginning of the talk, the interview, you talked about girl books and and publishing houses wanting to have female pronouns in the yeah. title. So are the overwhelming majority of readers of these thriller crime books women? So yes. this, <laughs> yeah. the, the number I'm getting right now, or the number that I've heard, is 80%. Uh, yeah, I've um, heard anything from 65 to 75. So, uh, and, and this is not, and this is, um, all reading too. Um, I mean, just they are like women readers are holding up the are floating the publishing industry. Male readers are disappearing. Um, to be fair, I think a lot of male writers, at least uh, so it's claimed, are more nonfiction readers and more female readers are more readers of fiction. At least that's what I've been told. I think that's probably true, and I but. Um, but I also, and well, in our field, it's definitely women. And, um, and some of that is um, book club driven, um, which is this great, I mean, it's always been around, but I mean, I think it's taking off in a way in the last five, six years, this phenomenon of um, people returning to book clubs and, uh, and, and, some, and some sort of influencers like Reese Witherspoon and people out there who are making suggestions for for book club reads and, and so on, so there's... Oprah's been around for ages. But yeah, no, I, I guess Oprah really restarted that, um, you know, when she did the book club, the original book club, so... Yeah, I, um, it's, it's definitely 
um, I, I hear from more readers who are women than men I, by far. One thing I would add to that is that uh, in my second book, as I started plotting out what my second book was going to be, I was thinking of making the victim a male. And I discussed it with my agent, and she said, no, no. They want the dead person to be a woman. The victim has to be a woman. Uh, I said, why? I, she had no real idea, but she said, women victims sell a whole lot better than male victims. Uh, well, that's one of the things I was wondering about, if it was true that it is mostly women reading these books and holding up the history, if it has something to do with women traditionally being held down, the whole feminist movement, and, and so, for women to read about the bad guys and they get caught. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of authors, it's probably pretty close to a 50-50 split in the mystery field. I mean, there are an awful lot of very good female writers, but I think there are also, uh, uh, hopefully present company not accepted, very good male writers out there doing their thing. Um, there's lots of psychological reasons why, uh, you know, why do people love thrillers? Why do people love dark thrillers? Um, you know, books that books that scare you. And I th so there can be a lot of psychological reasons about that. That's true that um, that dead women sell books, and um, that's always been around. I mean, it's a good title, actually. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look at the pulp covers from the 50s, 60s. I mean, it's, you know, beautiful dead woman. And, uh, you know, and then there's a, and there's a lot of talk out there. There's some interesting think pieces that have been put out there saying, is this, you know, are there too many brutalized women in, in mystery fiction? You know, it's becoming a topic. That's interesting. I wonder if the Me Too movement as a whole uh, will have any uh, impact on that. Uh, and perhaps uh, have more male victims and possibly at the hands of uh, women killers. I don't know. But so far, that has not been a major factor. Anybody else? Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for attending. I enjoyed it. I hope Peter did. Yeah, great conversation. Thank you all. A lot of fun. Uh -huh.